Grace, peace, and mercy are yours from the triune God, who is Parent, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If you will, just allow me an extra minute or two before I get to my sermon so we can contemplate on the words of Mary. And if you will with me, just take a deep breath and just close your eyes and breathe in through your mouth and out through your nose and meditate on the words full of grace. What does it mean to be full of grace? What does that look like lived out tangibly in the world? Amen. In the gospel account that would have been read today, were it not the feast day of the Blessed Virgin Mary and my birthday, which is uh, which is not a feast day, uh, uh, but maybe one day. <laughs> In the gospel that would have been read. Jesus said, I have come to set the world on fire, and oh, how I wish it were already burning. Do you think I've come to bring unity? No. I tell you, division. From now on, there will be division, son against father, father against son, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, and son-in-law against father-in-law. You look at the skies and you see where the wind blows and you can tell what the weather is going to be like. You hypocrites! How can you look at the weather and the sky and yet you cannot discern the present time? I thought I should read that before I get into the gospel text and really unpack it. Uh, side by side with the Magnificat and Mary's song in Luke because I think they pair so well together. Because what I want to talk about today is Mary as prophet. Mary's song is in fact a prophetic song if we think about what prophecy means. A prophecy in some ways has become murky. It's become this thing that people do to predict the future, like some kind of oracle at Delphi, sitting in a smoke-filled room and going, ooh. <laughs> but that's not what prophecy is. Prophecy is speaking truth to power. Prophecy is telling the powers and principalities of this world that their time, it's ticking. And that's why we call God's reign the kingdom, or the queendom, if you will. That's why we call it the reign, the kingdom, the queendom, the kingdom. Because everything else will bow down to it. And all of the powers and principalities and rulers of this world will submit to it. But not in a way, I think that is forceful or tyrannical because God's reign is quite different because the reign of Christ is a reign of mercy and justice and peace for all people. And I think if we want to understand what God's kingdom looks like, we have to understand the person who brings it, Jesus. And to understand what Jesus' kingdom is like, we have to understand what Jesus was for and what he was against. Jesus is not a respectable redeemer. He's a scandalous savior. Jesus says plainly, I haven't come so that people will be unified. In fact, people will be divided because of me. And Mary prophesies this in her song. He will cast the mighty from their thrones. 
and the corrupt rich he will send away empty. He will lift the lowly and exalt the humble. And I think if we look at the gospel as a whole, it's very clear who Jesus was for. Jesus was for the marginalized, the oppressed, the women and the men doing sex work to survive because they didn't know where their next meal was coming from, the lepers and the chronically ill, those with pre-existing conditions, and children who this world sometimes sees as a nuisance, Christ said, let them come to me. Christ viewed everyone as worthy of his love and his mercy and viewed the lowly as God's people and in fact called them his siblings. Whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters and siblings, you have done to me. These are the people Jesus was for. So what was he against? Systems of power that hold people down? Militarism? Violence, greed, consumerism, especially at the expense of our siblings who don't hold privilege in this world. But Jesus was especially opposed to faith that failed to transform people. Jesus was especially opposed to toxic and bad religion. The martyr and anti-fascist theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer called this bad religion that failed to transform people cheap grace. Cheap grace is an epidemic in the church today. Cheap grace is a grace that people will talk about and proclaim and fail to live out. And I saw this more specifically, of all places, on the internet. (laughs) Yes, that great realm of the accuser. I am so often very proud to call myself an Episcopalian. And not just because I think we have really cool accents and nice robes. (laughs) Though that is part of it. I'm very proud of my church because our leadership spends so much time trying to dissect the issues of today and helping people understand them from a faith-based lens and a Jesus-based lens. And in all of these documents that have been released to the public, I have never seen any partisan views explicitly expressed, only solid statements that use scripture the ancient traditions and teachings of the church and sound theology that help us to understand that Christ gave us a command to be committed to being a voice for justice, liberation, and peace in the world. Yet, as I was reading recent articles about the climate and on immigration, I did what you are never supposed to do I read the comments. And to my shock and great sorrow, I saw people who belong to my own denomination commenting really awful and terrible things. And this is not a judgment on them. This is simply me trying to do what Jesus said and discern the time. As I was reading it, I saw people saying things like, can the church just stay out of politics? And can we just talk about Jesus already? This is cheap grace. Jesus' commands in the gospel have an inherently political ramification in the world. And I will say this, as the great theologians of liberation said, Justice is not simply a little chunk of the gospel. It is part and parcel of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is inherently a story of liberation. 
of a liberation from the fallenness of humanity, of the, from liberation from death and despair and sorrow, but also liberation for the poor and the marginalized. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this about cheap grace. Cheap grace means grace sold on the market like cheap wares. The sacraments, forgiveness of sins, the consolations of the faith are thrown away at cut rate prices. He goes on to say, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline Communion without confession, absolution without personal confession, cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate in the world. We live in a world that has an epidemic of cheap grace. We see it all the time, do we not? In the quote-unquote moral majority, a more more properly termed the immoral majority, that say that religion is about the soul. It's about saving a soul. Well, I call that garbage. Because that is not what the incarnation of Christ is about. It is about becoming one of us. Dirty, gritty, down-to-earth, fleshy, getting headaches and nosebleeds and scraping his knees, Mary picking him up and saying, again? (laughs) Seriously, Joseph, you were supposed to be watching him. (laughs) Yeah, there's a reason why he isn't mentioned much in the Gospels. Uh, But that is the incarnation. It's the incarnation of God becoming one of us, being hungry, being thirsty, needing support, needing a mother. And I think this is where Mary comes in. The model of Mary is inexhaustible for Christians. She was, after all, the first Christian. John was the second Christian when he leaped in Elizabeth's womb. But when Mary heard the pronouncement from the angel Gabriel... She leaped and said, The Mighty One has done great things, and holy is God's name. And God will cast down the mighty from their thrones, and will send the rich away empty, and will, fe- and will fill the lowly and the hungry with good things. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is not the gospel of this world. It is costly grace. It costs something. It costs your life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, a book that would later have him arrested by Nazi authorities and later martyred, that when Christ calls someone, he calls them to die. To die to themselves, to die to the world, and to what the world deems is valuable. Because if you take a minute and you think about what it means to be full of grace, it probably looks a lot different than what the world deems as success. It looks like being humble so that you will be exalted. It looks like being lowly so that you will be filled with good things. This is a complete subversion of the order of the world. And Mary was like 007, where God gave her this mission, and God talked to her, and she was like, your mission for today is to bring salvation into the world. And Mary said, on it. (laughs) And that is why we celebrate the feast day of Mary. Because none of us can be perfect like Christ, but I think that Mary may be a good role model for how to be a Christian in the world. Proclaiming good news, rejoicing in the power of God's Spirit and what it does with us. 
There's a prayer that comes from the Orthodox tradition that's repeated often in Anglican liturgies. And it goes something along the lines of, O Mary, how blessed you were in bearing God, but how even more blessed you were to keep God's word. None of us can bear the incarnate God in our bodies, literally, but we can all bear God in the way we interact with those in the world. We can proclaim good news to the poor. We can offer consolation to the brokenhearted. And we can be prophetic when we speak words of truth to power and say, your time, it's ticking. Because God's reign is coming to earth, it's breaking in, and it has been breaking in since the moment that Mary said, tell God, I said yes to the angel Gabriel. We can all be Theotokoses. We can all be bearers of God. And that is why grace is so costly. I must decrease and Christ must increase. May we all learn that from Mary. In the name of God, Mother, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.